I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, yet still I'll follow. My name's Carson Cole, as Bob said. Um, it is a real honor to be here today. Um, you'll have to excuse me, I haven't shaved in over a week. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have been treated uh, with a lot of uh, love and reception. Uh, I've been fed too much um, by Diane, mainly and Dave, and uh, I'm re really grateful in spite of the pounds that I've gained. Um, it's important to me to be transparent and upfront with you from the beginning that uh, I'm 51 years old. I have lived, I became a Christian very young um, in Coronation, Alberta, actually Brownfield, uh, raised on a farm. Um, I'm not gonna go into my testimony in too much detail because that would take us uh, all week, um, but I do encourage you to read my testimony. Uh, it's important before you make that vote to me that you know transparently where I'm at. Um, I lived a selfish life. I made decisions as a young man after I got married that uh, uh, retained bitterness and unforgiveness in my life. Um, Satan used that as a foothold and I made choices that drew me into alcoholism, drug abuse, and uh, debauchery. I harvested a, a life of sinful nature. When I read what Paul says sinful nature produces, that is exactly what I produced in my life. If you Google my name, you will find me. And I'm not uh, proud of everything that's on the internet, and there's no way I can take it off, and I don't want to hide it. Um, I want to say to younger people, to seed, and to all of us, seed carefully your crop. Don't take it for granted. What you seed now will come to fruition. For me, it took 30 years plus, and I am now harvesting a crop that is hard to bear. And unfortunately, there was no crop failure. Um, and uh, there is... Um, consequences for sin and I am enduring those consequences in my life as we speak so coming here I would I need to be transparent about where I'm at I love the Lord I fell on my knees in last June and uh, went back to my home church in Brownfield where my two brothers and my sister and my home church were praying for me for over 30 years. And um, there's just one example. I have a lady, Mary Black. I'm not sure if she's related to you or not, but uh, she's 91 years old, and she prayed every day for me for 30 years plus. And I want to encourage you not to give up on your loved ones, not to give up on your grandchildren, your children, your neighbors, do not give up. It is never too late. And I am living proof that God can call us back. And in spite of my sin, I can now start to experience peace and joy and gentleness. And um, it's been a real journey at Prairie. I've only been at Prairie for one year. Um, so I'm very much a novice. This opportunity is very much... Uh, Maybe I'm getting more out of it than I'm going to be able to give. Um, you have four retired pastors here. You have missionaries with, with Art and Emma here. You have a mature congregation. And I already sense discipleship and mentoring that is going to be very important to my healing. 
Um, that is what interests me very much so about this opportunity and the chance to um, have an experience here in Westlock. Um, and I must say I'm at peace that you guys should vote as the Holy Spirit directs you because um, uh, I'm not sure what I would vote for if, if I was in your position. So I want to say that clearly and it's been an uh, absolutely wonderful time being here this weekend regardless. I've come away with a lot of knowledge, a lot of tools, and uh, a lot of love. But I'm going to get into my message, and it's the triumphant entry. It's Palm Sunday today, and I'm so glad, Ian, that you chose to read all four accounts of Palm Sunday, because Palm Sunday uh, is one of only eight subjects that has been recorded in all four Gospels. This is not by accident, and I don't believe it's by uh, just the men that wrote it thought it was important. I believe God thought this was important. So God told us in all four gospel accounts a separate angle of the same story. There's little details that are different, if you notice that. I encourage you this week to take the time to read them again and pick out the differences in, in, and all the detail because this is not a story that we're passing down from generation to generation. This story has detail. And God put that detail in there to tell us, not somebody made this up. This happened. We do have historic uh, accounts of the Passover and the crucifixion. The crucifixion is something that um, is the only thing that atheists or any religion cannot deny. It's, you cannot uh, argue it. It happened. The crucifixion happened. Was it God's son? Did he rise again? You can have lots of different arguments about that, but you cannot argue about the crucifixion happened and Jesus Christ died on a cross. The Palm Sunday is the beginning of, of the Passion Week. So this whole week is something that I, I encourage you to reflect on, and I'm sure you are, in, in everything that Jesus has done. Most of the Gospels are about this week as what's happened here. If you read the Gospels, most of the Gospels are about this week. Um, just really briefly, and you'll have to forgive my eyes, um, on Sunday, which is today, now in Jewish calendar, this was Nisan, not that that matters, Nisan the 10th, and that works out to early spring, which is why we're having Palm Sunday today. On Sunday, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey. Monday, Jesus curses a fig tree and cleanses the temple. When we say cleanses the temple, he was righteously angry and flipped those tables over. I'm going to explain that a bit more. Um, on Tuesday, Jesus' uh, authority is questioned and he teaches in the temple. And, and he's making the religious leaders very angry by this time. Um, Wednesday, Jesus' enemies plot to kill him um, as they were plotting for months already. On Thursday, Jesus shares the Last Supper with his disciples and prays in Gethsemane. Um, on Friday, Jesus is betrayed by Judas, and he's arrested, tried, crucified, and buried. So this Friday is Good Friday. Um, Saturday, Jesus' body remains in the tomb. The apostles are scared. They scatter. Uh, they lose hope. Um, Sunday... Jesus rises again. Um, and that is just a brief description of what happens this week. Now, why is it important that Palm Sunday happened today on, uh, in early spring on the 10th of Nisan? Uh, not the vehicle, Nisan, the Jewish month, the Jewish calendar. Um, that was the day by Mosaic law that Jews were to pick out their lamb to sacrifice. And what they did is they went and they usually they came to the temple and bought a lamb. That's an important detail. Um, uh, and so they picked out that lamb and brought that lamb home to their house. And, and, and for five days, they watched that lamb and made sure that that was a perfect lamb. It was important that it was perfect. Why did, why did Mosaic Law say that? We, we need a perfect sacrifice for ourselves. Jesus was no accident to come into Jerusalem, and his timing 
And the hour of him coming into Jerusalem was perfect because he was telling us today, and he was telling those people in that ancient time, in 33 AD, that we needed to pick out the lamb, the final sacrifice. So God was talking to us. That was no accident. It happened on the 10th of Nisan. This was God talking to us. Now already, Ian wisely read Zechariah 9. So we have 500 years before this event took place. Zechariah 9, and, and it's quoted in Matthew. It's quoted in, in all the Gospels. Behold, your king comes riding on the colt of a donkey. Humble. Uh, actually, the, the Hebrew word was ani. It wasn't humble. It wasn't gentle. The Greek word, or sorry, the Hebrew word was ani. And ani means poor and afflicted. Jesus was not rich. Jesus did not have money. He wore the same robe. What we, we believe he didn't even have actually a change of clothes. And he walked wherever he went. He did not own a donkey. He did not own a horse. And so his sandals would have been worn out. He probably, it's not for sure, but he probably had a beard and long hair. He probably looked more, I probably look more like him than, than you do. <laughs> and that's not because he was trying to be stylish. It's because he had no time and no money. So he was poor and afflicted. Even when he stayed in Jerusalem. Now, bear with me. There's a lot of detail. So try to take, I'm trying to create the context and the story of what's happened here. First of all, God's talking to us. Talking to us today. I believe and I know Jesus knew me when he, when he crawled on that don donkey. He knew you. He knew what he had to do. He knew your health problems. He knew your financial problems. He knew your sinful problems. He knew your relatives, your children, your grandchildren. He knew your future. He knew the day you were born and the day you're going to die. And he had a job to do. And that what, what was on his mind. I've entitled the sermon, The Kingdom of God or the Kingdom of Men. Jesus brought the kingdom of God. And what I'm trying to get through today, throughout all of this talk, is how are we concentrating on focusing on the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of men. It changes everything, all of our decisions. If Jesus would have been thinking about the kingdom of men, we wouldn't be here today. Our souls and our lives would be a waste of time. In fact, we probably wouldn't even be around right now. Jesus was focused on the kingdom of God, and he was talking to us, starting with being there to pick out the lamb for the Passover. Now, uh, <laughs> you know, I have to tell a quick story. When, when I was young, I used to believe in Santa Claus. And as I got older, probably about 9 or 10, and I'm sorry if there's any young people that still believe in Santa Claus, but I woke up one day and realized there was no Santa Claus. <laughs> it's true, it's true. As I got a little older, I had children of my own, and uh, I had to pretend I was Santa Claus. And now that I'm older, I look in the mirror and I realize I'm starting to look like Santa Claus. Um, but if I say to you, I'm Santa Claus, you have three choices, and C.S. Lewis first brought this out, and you guys have heard this, so I'll make it quick. You, I, I'm either a liar, I believe I'm Santa Claus, but I'm not, I'm trying to trick you, or I'm a lunatic, so I actually do believe I'm Santa Claus, but I'm not, or I'm Santa Claus. That's the only three choices you have. Jesus said, I am the Father, the Father is in me. I am the son of God. I am the son of men. Over and over again, he got in trouble by the religious people of his day because of his authority on scripture. If you have seen me, you have seen the father. I am God. We only have three choices. The world only has three choices. And I'm not against any choice that you make. But you have to make one of those choices. Jesus was either a liar or he was a lunatic or he was God. 
Now, I know that I'm in the majority here that we believe he was God. I want you to know that this isn't a story. This is something that was designed from the beginning of, of creation and eternally before. We can't even imagine, uh, we have finite minds. You know, I'm in theology class in school and I just get a headache. <laughs> you know, I, I, I really can't figure out the Trinity. I really couldn't explain it to you, I really couldn't. I, I know that there's a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit, and they are one, and they are three separate, and you know, I know that. But what I do know is I was blind, and now I see, I know that. I was lost, and now I'm found, I know that. I've lived it. I had anger, and bitterness, and emptiness, and now I have fulfillment, and joy. Joy is different than happiness. Happiness depends on circumstances. Joy is Paul in jail, or Joseph in jail. Joy is beyond circumstances. It's beyond your health, beyond your money. It's the kingdom of God. Joy comes from the kingdom of God. And so, why am I saying this? Because first, I want to I want to talk a little bit about the people, the players involved in this story. First, there was the apostles. Judas believed Jesus was a lunatic. I actually respect Judas a bit. He was not that much further out than the rest of the apostles. If we read the accounts of the apostles, the truth is, is they thought Jesus was going to be an earthly king. They thought Jesus was going to be somebody that booted out the Romans. The Romans were there for over a hundred years. They were not nice people. There was good and bad in any, in any crowd. There were some Romans that believed in Jesus, but the majority of the Romans hated the Israelites, and the Israelites hated the Romans. I hate to say New Democrats. <laughs> I hate to say liberals. I hate to say Donald Trump. Sometimes we can feel uh, overwhelmed by what our governments are doing or they're allowing the legalization of marijuana or they're allowing this and that. But the truth is the kingdom of God is beyond these things. If God put Donald Trump and, and the New Democrats and the liberals in that position, then he has a reason to do it. And, and we must pray for them. And, and, and be out to vote next time we have to vote. <laughs> and I won't go any farther than that. But the Israelites had no choice. They had no vote. For over 100 years, the Romans, they raped their daughters. And this was, you know, they murdered. This was not nice government. They, they could whip you for no reason without a trial. They overtaxed them. They taxed them so hard that all the Israelites were in deep poverty. These Israelites had a reason to hate the Romans. And in their mind, they were looking for a Messiah. And when they read Zechariah 9, and Daniel 9 is, is another uh, uh, prophecy that I encourage you to look up. Daniel 9, it's very exact. Daniel 9 will take you right to the 10th of Nisan in 33 AD, if you get your calculator out and understand it. Google it. Google Daniel 9, and you'll, you'll be able to study exactly how that works. This was no accident that that day happened. So the Romans were hated, and the Romans also hated. The Romans were soldiers. They were told what to do. They weren't paid that well. They were taken from Macedonia and from Rome and from Corinth and Galatia, and they were, they were told, you got to go to Jerusalem. There, there's all these people going to be in Jerusalem, there's, and, you're, and they're, they're not happy. They're leaving their families. They got their swords. They got their backpacks, and they just, it's hassle. Jesus is a hassle to them. It's just work to them. The Romans were a lot like our world right now probably here in West Lock too. They were just going on with their lives, trying to have fun, trying to, they were pagan, mostly pagan. Actually, pagan is quite common in our world today again. Actually, people are more spiritual now than when I was a youth. When I was a youth, it was evolution, 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 evolution. And now people are starting to go, man, this couldn't have happened. How did that fish 
grow legs? How, how did how did all of a sudden he got lungs? I mean, people are starting to get sensible. I mean, this this uh, stand here didn't start off as a twig on the ground. It's some, you know, somebody designed this. They made it. That means that's logical to me, and I'm not going to get into evolution. But people are now starting to be spiritual. Oh, aliens came and and they made us. They, people are more apt to believe Elvis is alive than Jesus. You know, it, it's really depressing if you watch History Channel with all the false preaching that is just spewed out to us nonstop. Oh, these aliens, you got to have a funny haircut, and then you can talk about aliens. Well, we're de- it, the Bible is the truth. The Bible is the truth. Again, I know because I was blind, and now I can see I was lost, and now I'm found. No, I don't need any more proof than that. I know Jesus came to me and, and, and healed me and saved me. And that is something that's not an emotion. That is something that I knew that I had to go to prairie because I can't change. I knew that I had to be changed. And God can change us. If you try to change yourself with Dr. Phil, you go right ahead, but it won't happen. If you want to be changed, you let God change you. And I'm living proof of that in process now in my life. Um, so the Romans, they drank. They had heavy parties. They were very immoral, sexually immoral. Um, Paul wrote, flee from sexual immorality. No other sin a person commits outside the body. Um, your bodies are the temple of God. Paul had to deal with this because guess who was a lot Actually, a majority of the early church, Romans, Roman citizens. And you know, it's a good thing because most of us here are Gentiles. And if Jesus decided that he was going to listen to that crowd to get rid of the Romans, and he was going to listen to the apostles get rid of the Romans, those Romans wouldn't have been saved. They would have been decimated. And us here today would have been affected by that. Roman Catholic Church was the first church. Why? Because Rome actually received the gospel in spades through the book of Acts, through Paul's ministry, Romans. Jesus knew my name on that donkey, and Jesus knew the Romans' name. He died for them, too. His kingdom was way beyond politics. It was way beyond how much money am I making? How much taxes am I? It was even beyond murder and rape. It was beyond sin. His mindset, he knew what he had to do for all of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The world. It wasn't just for one group of Israelites. It was for all of us. It was for the entire world. I spent six years in, in, uh, off and on in, in South Korea, and the church is just booming in South Korea. Churches with 60,000 members, churches with, with 30,000 members. I woke up in the middle of the night at 3 in the morning in a hotel, and there was a soccer stadium across the road from us. And they're, they're all cheering, and I, I phoned the front desk. You guys have soccer games at 3 in the morning? And she goes, no, this is prayer meeting. <laughs> it's prayer meeting. And there was, honestly, 60,000, 70,000 people in that auditorium praising God. We, we have something to learn here in Canada. And, and it starts here. I have already, I can tell you right now that I sense the Holy Spirit in this congregation, maturity, God's grace. I spent time, uh, luckily, with Lyle last night, with, with Bob. Uh, not much time with Ian yet, but I want to, and a lot of time with Dave. And you guys are blessed to have this kind of knowledge, but more than the knowledge and more than, you know, the, Dave's got his master's. I mean, he's, he's educated. But it's not that that impresses me. It's that he knows the love of Jesus. And and he knows how much he doesn't deserve anything. And that Jesus came to, he knows the gospel. This is the gospel. 
So Jesus gets on this donkey. Who else do we got? Well, we got the Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, the religious leaders. Now, Jerusalem was packed. We know this because we have a historic document that's from 40 AD. So that's about 10 years after Jesus was crucified. It's a historical document. And it states that 260,000 lambs were sacrificed that year. Over 260,000 lambs. Every lamb that was sacrificed represented 10 Jewish men. So those men also brought their children and wives to Jerusalem too. There was only one temple where you were allowed to have sacrifices in Israel. That was in Jerusalem. It was kind of like the Pharisees had a monopoly on sacrificial, biz, uh, the business side of it. Because these families would all come in, 260,000 lambs times 10 is 2.6 million people. Jerusalem was packed. It was 10 times the population. This happened once a year. It was the biggest event of the year. Passover was the biggest event of the year. So sometimes we think, oh, there was a crowd of people waving palm leaves. This was 100 thousand, probably 200,000 people waving palm leaves and dropping their clo cloaks on the ground. This wasn't a small crowd. Jerusalem was packed. So the Pharisees, those people that were traveling didn't want to bring a lamb or a bull or a goat or doves or even their grain offerings. It was easier for them to go to the temple and purchase a lamb. Purchase a goat, purchase a bull for all their sacrifices. Now, the, the Passover lamb, didn't, sacrifices didn't start till 3 p.m. on Friday. Good Friday, 3 p.m. What do we know about 3 p.m. on Good Friday? Just as a side note, that's exactly when Jesus died, according to Scripture. 3 p.m. on Friday. And by Mosaic law, that's when the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. So you can imagine with 2.6 million or probably more people buying lambs, how much money was involved? You know, I was talking to Jim just yesterday, and we both said, you know, smell the money. You'll probably find the problem with human nature. Smell the money. You'll probably find the problem. And the Pharisees weren't just upset at Jesus because he was taking their authority away. They were upset with Jesus because he was threatening their lifestyle, their income, their status, their money. They had big houses. They needed maybe three more horses to satisfy their wife. They needed more furniture. They wanted indoor plumbing, which you could have if you were really rich back then. They wanted a swimming pool in their backyard. They wanted another fancy hat. They wanted some fancy clothes. Jesus was threatening their, their livelihood, their money. So we look at where they see in the kingdom of God. In their minds, we're serving God. Religion is a funny thing. Religion is man trying to work your way to God. You're trying to say prayers or study your Bible or, or whatever religion it is. You're, you're five times a day, you're on a mat bowing down or you're, you're Buddhist. You, know, you, you don't eat certain food, you, whatever those rules are. But Jesus, Christianity, is God, is the opposite of that. God is coming to us just the way we are. There's nothing you have to do. That's scary to say that, but I'm telling you straight up. There is nothing you have to do. You are saved by grace. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through what? Through Jesus Christ. Because right from the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, and he put the tree of knowledge of, knowledge of good and evil in that garden, why did he do that? Why did he even give us a chance? He knew already that Adam and Eve would sin. Be, same as you and me. I would have picked that fruit. All of us would have. 
And, and in our way, we all did. We all sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody. This, we know this. And we know this in our lives. Doesn't matter how religious. You, we, I don't have to preach that. You know that. So what, what is the purpose of trying to live a righteous life? What is the purpose of trying to be sanctified? What is the purpose of trying to uh, obey God? Because it works. These are not rules to get to heaven. You try to follow the rules to get to heaven, you won't get to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, and that's grace. That's Jesus taking our place, dying for our sins. But we will experience joy, peace, gentleness, and I'm living proof. I believe I was saved all those years of that sinful life. I believe if I died, I would have went to heaven. I really do. I had faith in Christ. But the emptiness, the pain that I tried to drown out with alcohol, and drugs, and fame, and money. I can tell you right now, it's a waste of time. I am more fulfilled in Dave's and Diane's house than in my house that I had with a swimming pool and a jacuzzi and five bathrooms. I am more fulfilled in a vehicle that my brother-in-law and my sister gave me than a Lexus that I used to drive. I am happier in Christ than I've ever been in 35 years because I knelt down, gave my life to him and said, I'm tired of being the pilot and you're my co-pilot. I want to switch seats. I want you to be the pilot. I will be the co-pilot. And that's why I am now obeying, not to work my way to heaven, but because these are guidelines for our sake and for the glory of God. If you have children, you want them to obey, you get a buzz, for lack of a better word, when your children obey you. And when they do the right thing, you are glorified. You are fulfilled. And also, your children are fulfilled because they made the right decision. They want to eat licorice all day instead of their vegetables. They want to eat jujubes. They want to eat ice cream all day. And you go, no. And they obey you. You are glorified. And your children are benefited. Because their teeth don't fall out. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? So for us as Christians, when we obey, we are glorifying God. God is glorified in that. But also, we receive benefits. There is a reason why we need to live and understand God's commands and obey his commands and not get wishy-washy on them. He commands this. The Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. Our society does not... I worked on the rigs for three years. If I would have took off Sunday, sorry, I'm going to church. I'm fired. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a job that makes you work on Sundays, but I am saying at some point, it needs to be a priority or you will suffer personally. So you have to make those choices. I have a wife that, that works as a health aide. She has to work Sundays. But you have to make these choices as to how you honor God. I'm not going to judge you. But I can tell you in my life, I made ten dollars to $15,000 a month take home on the rigs and was miserable, lost hope, all hope. I, I am proud. I love the guys I was working with. It was like we were in a foxhole together, and, and, and we all w loved each other, and that's how we got through the day. But I didn't have church. I didn't have accountability. I didn't have fellowship, and I suffered for it. We need to obey the commands God has la laid out for us, and I encourage you to take those seriously. But that is not going to save you. Only the grace of Christ is going to save you. When he got on that donkey, he began his journey, his week-long journey to die for us. Now, just recapping, the apostles, they were excited. 
They're going to go to he- they're going to be part of a they gave up their lives and their their families must have thought these you guys are crazy. You dropped your fishing nets, you left your tax collecting job, you're following this nutcase around. And then they started to get validified. Oh, this guy's doing miracles. This guy's this guy's getting a name for himself. Now they're now they're in Jerusalem and these millions of people are going Hosanna. He's the Messiah. Why? What really what happened? If 4 days earlier Jesus was at Mary Martha's place and he and he raised Lazarus from the dead. 4 days before this triumphant en- entry. So when he, when he, Lazarus was dead for four days. The Bible tells us that the, the Pharisees, it's interesting, the Pharisees were upset that he raised Lazarus from the dead. They didn't like that. This was just another stake in their income. You know, oh no, he's got proof. He raised somebody from the dead. So they put out wanted posters, not only on Jesus, they put wanted posters out on Lazarus too. They wanted to kill Lazarus again. Poor old Lazarus was dead was raised again. Now they want to kill him again. You know, I, I felt bad for the guy. But, um, but there was lots of witnesses at this event. These witnesses all went into Jerusalem, and part of those witnesses were probably in this crowd. And they went, and so the apostles were feeling, you can imagine, vindicated for the three years that they spent with Jesus. They're starting to go, I want to sit on the right-hand side of you. I want to sit on the left-hand side of you when you come into your kingdom. I want to be the guy. They, they, and Jesus was straight up with them. I'm going to be taken by the Pharisees. I'm going to be handed over to the Romans. I'm going to be whipped, scourged, spit on. In John, uh, in John, he says, uh, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. So they didn't like Lazarus. Also, there's many, many times that we can see that, that God, uh, that Jesus told the apostles straight up what was going to happen. He prophesied exactly what was going to happen. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be dead. I'm going to be risen again in three days. But the apostles, it kind of went in one ear and out the other because they weren't thinking about the kingdom of God. They were still thinking about the kingdom of men. So they were thinking, I might get some money out of this. I'm going to get some status out of this. I'm going to be vindicated. My family's going to think I'm really something. And I'm going to be ruling with Jesus. In, and Peter, look at what he did in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, after Jesus said, I will build my church. Not on Peter, on, on what Peter said. You are the Messiah. You are the risen. You are the son of God. That's what he's building his church on. And Peter was all hyped up. I'm ready to die for you. So that was not such a bad thing. He pulls out his sword, and you guys know the story. The guards come, and they're going to, to uh, uh, arrest Jesus, and Peter pulls out his sword and cuts off the ear of one of the guards, and Jesus rebukes him because Jesus is thinking about the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of men. The apostles didn't get it right until Jesus was risen from the dead. They actually had given up. They were running scared. Peter denied him three times. Now, how does this apply to us? In our day-to-day lives, we can get bogged down. I was listening to CBC on the way up here. I haven't heard it in months, and I turned it on, and it was exactly the same as when I left it. (laughs) It never changed whatsoever. Uh, A terrorist attack in Stockholm. Somebody stole the truck and killed a bunch of people. The... Honorable Donald Trump is firing missiles into Syria. You know, I'm not here to argue whether this stuff is good or bad. It's just all the same. It hasn't changed. And all of this stuff is, is, it can bog us down with seeing the kingdom of men. And then how do I uh, make more money? 
How do I get a raise? How am I going to save up? I got to have more for, I'm going to retire. I got to, I'm worried about my retirement fund. What about my government? Oh, my health. All these things are important and God does care about our details. And we have promises. We have many promises about our details. But the kingdom of God is beyond this. We need revival. Revival starts with us. Revival starts with our relationship to the almighty living God who has ridden that donkey, knowing your name, hanging on that cross, knowing my name. We need to have intimate relationship with him first and foremost. That comes by praying, that comes by studying scripture, and that comes by fellowship, what we're doing right here today and what we did yesterday in Dave's house and what we do throughout the week. We're humans. We're going to let each other down. If you guys get to know me, I'm going to let you down. I'm a human. I'm going to try not to, but I will because I'm a human. We have to forgive each other as we have been forgiven, and we have to get tight with what we believe and who we believe in and our values, our values. Our values come from scripture, from knowing the word, and from looking at our history. My parents were born and raised in the 30s. Sometimes we have to be broke to get our values back. In the 20s, they were all partying, drinking, everything fornicating, everything was going nuts. And then the 30s came. Maybe God wants that again. Maybe we need it. Maybe we need to lose our houses, our jobs. Maybe we do. That's not for me to decide. That's for God to decide. If we need it, bring it on. Because the kingdom of God is beyond the kingdom of men. We're not here just to uh, live selfish lives like I did. We are here to draw close to God and make him known. Make him known. How are we making him known? First, we must revive ourselves. We must come to the cross ourselves. We must really understand what a living God has done for us. There is a skylark, beautiful feathers, flying around. And he looks down one day. He had to find worms every day. He had a nice life, but it was kind of a hassle because he had to find worms every day. And he looks down one day and he sees a worm salesman. And he'd never seen that worm salesman before. Now, the skylark didn't know it, but that worm salesman was Satan in disguise. The skylark flies down and he talks to the worm salesman. Boy, those worms look good. How much for one of those worms? And the salesman goes, a feather, just a feather. And the skylark looks, he's got all kinds of feathers. And he goes, sure, he plucks out a feather. Gives it to the worm salesman. The next day, the skylark's flying around. That worm was good. It was better than the ones he was finding. Plump, round, juicy. Looks down, there's that, there's that worm salesman again. He plucks out another feather, gives it to the worm salesman, gets another worm. The next day, he does it again. Weeks go by, months go by, years go by. And one day, that skylark wakes up, and he can't fly. He's lost all his feathers. And that worm salesman comes along and cages him up, puts him in prison. This happened to me. Value by value, decision by decision, little by little, plucking out feathers, one by one, eating those juicy worms that tasted pretty good for a moment, but not eternally, not in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of men, those worms were tasty. But in the kingdom of God, I was losing all my feathers until I finally lost my ability to fly. And then Satan came in for the kill. I made the right decision. I went back to my home church. I went back to my two brothers and my sister. And I went to Prairie. And I am healing. I believe I made the right decision coming to Westlock. And I am still in process of receiving a new feather every day. I can't say as I'm flying yet, but I know 
that God is recovering my feathers. So I encourage you not to have to make, the young ones especially, don't make the mistakes that us old people have made. We can tell you, believe us, just believe us. Don't learn it the hard way. Have a boring testimony. (laughs) Your goal should be to have a boring testimony. I was saved at a young age and I followed Jesus my whole life. I want to hear that testimony. (laughs) Exciting testimonies hurt and there's consequences for them and they're not worth it. So just believe us and believe in this. Truth is a really wonderful thing. Don't doubt. This is a Bible. I'm holding it. If I have it here and you can't see it, it's still a Bible. If I have it behind my back, it's still a Bible. The truth is I have a Bible behind my back. I don't care if you can see it or not. The truth is Jesus Christ came on the 10th of Nisan and he was picked out as the Passover lamb and he died on Good Friday, five days later, according to Mosaic law at 3 p.m. for us. And even more importantly, he rose again on Sunday. And hundreds of people seen him, and I've seen him now in my life. I was blind, now I see. That is not, nobody can take away that truth from me. Nobody can explain it away. And maybe if people haven't tasted Coca-Cola, they can't describe it. But I've tasted it, and it's bubbly, and it's kind of sweet, and it kind of makes you burp. And I know, I know what Coke tastes like. Coca-Cola, but if people in some other land have never tasted Coca-Cola, how do you explain that to them? It's pretty tough. I've tasted the grace of Jesus Christ. I've, I've tasted his forgiveness and his love, and I know that his gospel is true, and his gospel is this. There is nothing I can do to make him love me less. There is nothing I have done, nothing, that will make him love me less. There is nothing I can do that will make him love me more. He loves me completely and utterly now, just like he did when I was in the middle of sin. And when you're sinning, he loves you just as much as when you're not sinning. How do I know this? I have children. And even on on an earthly level, when they're disobeying me, I love them. And I'm a man. I'm a human. How much more does God love you? How much more does God love me? That's the gospel. That's why he got on that donkey. That's why he concentrated on being the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of men. He must have been tempted. He must have been tempted to just walk away from that cross, to walk away from that donkey and get on a white horse instead. And, and go party as the king of Israel and, and take care of those Romans and be the hero, he must have been tempted. I thank God that he did not get off that donkey. Just in final, a donkey has a cross on the back. I wish I had a picture for you. If anybody's seen a donkey, there is a cross on the back of donkeys. I don't think that's by accident. They're a beast of burden. God chose a beast of burden to carry Jesus who was carrying our burdens. All of your worries, all of your stresses, all of your sin, all of your guilt was on his back on top of that little donkey. Palm trees were to say salvation, joy. That's what they meant in that society. Salvation, joy, that's what the people were saying. But they had it wrong. It was salvation. It was joy, but it wasn't salvation from the Romans. It was salvation from themselves, from their own sins. And it was salvation to the Romans. The cloaks that they put on the ground were to show submission. I put my cloak on the ground. That was their culture. You walk on top of me. I am under your authority. I want you to be my king. We need that. We need to have that same attitude, but not for the same kingdom. They were thinking, I want you to be my king for the kingdom of 
man, we need to put our cloaks on the ground because we want him to be Lord of our life for the kingdom of God. I believe Westlock is lucky to have this church, and I believe Westlock is lucky to have you. And, uh, and again, I am uh, honored to be here, and you will be in my prayers, and I submit so much to ongoing healing, and whether that ends up being here in Westlock or, or in another location, I will stay in touch. And uh, you can pray for my wife. Her name is Leanne, and I ask just a personal favor that you keep her in mind. Um, her name is Leanne, and she is a very good lady who I sinned against in many ways. So I'm just going to close off in prayer. Father God, we are before you, right now inside of us. We all have hidden secrets. God, I ask that you identify those secrets. We have sins. We have things that we might be embarrassed about on Judgment Day. God, I want you to take care of them now, not on Judgment Day. I know you died for us. I know that your blood is sufficient for us. I know that you love us. God, I know that you love me when I don't deserve anything. You have given everything. Your grace is amazing. I will never be able to thank you enough. And Lord, all of us here today, we give you those hidden sins. We give you the bitterness that we're harboring against others. If we can't deal with it, God, we ask you to deal with it. We ask you to make us a path. God, if we need help, we ask you to provide that help. Counseling, fellowship, scripture, your Holy Spirit. God, don't abandon us. Take care of these things in our lives. We want revival, and that revival starts with us. And we are on our knees, excited to see what you are going to do next and how you are going to do it and what your plans are, not ours. God, in your holy name, we thank you for getting on that donkey. We thank you for cleansing the temple. We thank you for standing up to the lies of the Pharisees. We thank you for not taking down the Romans. We thank you for hanging on that tree. And we thank you for conquering death and rising again. And throughout this week, God, remind us each day of who you are intimately so that we cannot ignore that you're talking to us. In your holy name, amen. Now, do you want me to dismiss or? <laughs> well. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back.